yeah, welcome everybody to the new season of the uh, Single Cell Omics Lecture Series. Uh, really excited to have um, a great program again this season. Um, we will meet on a monthly basis now. Um, and we changed the time slot. So um, now the talks will be, as, as you um, have probably realized now, the talks will be now Wednesdays at 4 p.m. Central European time. And we're hoping um, to get lots of the attendance from overseas as well through this uh, time slot change. Um, so um, can you skip to the next slide? Yeah, great. <laughs> So the next talk will be um, actually on February 1st, so next month. Um, we don't have the final speaker set um, finalized yet, but so um, if you're interested, there are still slots available to give a talk. So if you're interested in giving a talk, you can apply on the website or write to, um, write to the organizing team, or um, you can also nominate other people that you would like to listen, uh, like to hear from. So today we have a really, uh, oh yeah, maybe the, the housekeeping first, right? So um, the organizational um, issues as, as usual. So we will have a 30 minute presentation uh, followed up by about 15 minutes of, of a discussion. And if you'd like to ask questions, you can either use the chat function here on Zoom or raise your hand and then we'll be able to unmute you and you can ask the question yourself. Um, so today we have um, Hedda, uh, it's a great pleasure to have Hedda Bademann with us today. Um, she joins us from DKFZ in Heidelberg. Um, and a couple of words about her. So she um, did her PhD um, in, and, uh, in uh, Freiburg at the Max Planck Institute for Immunobiology um, in 2001, and then joined the Nussenzweig lab uh, at Rockefeller University in New York for her postdoc and also a research assistant professor position. Um, and then she came back to Germany in 2006 and joined the Max Planck Institute for Infection Biology in Berlin. Um, and since 2014, she is now heading um, the B-cell immunology division at the DKFZ in, in Heidelberg. So she, uh, her research is very exciting and is concerned with um, antibodies responses and um, also B cell um, responses under various pathogenic and non-pathogenic conditions. And um, I think we will hear a lot about this uh, today uh, in the single cell context. And uh, with that, I hand it over to, um, to Hedda and um, look, looking for, very much forward to your talk. Thank you, Fabian, uh, for the kind introduction. Yes, so as you said, do you, do you see the the full screen or is there? Yes, we see your pointer and the full screen. Okay, good. So yes, uh, my lab uh, for a long time has been interested in understanding um, B cell responses in humans mostly. Uh, we move to the mouse whenever necessary, uh, of course, to study um, responses in organs. And we are very much interested in uh, understanding how responses evolve over time at the level of the individual uh, antigen receptor or antibody that the B cells make. Um, so we can look at this uh, at, the, at the broader picture at the cell population level where we have a naive B cell repertoire or any B cell repertoire. And if uh, a pathogen uh, is invading the host, of course, the cells that have the appropriate receptor will get activated, uh, ideally with the cell uh, with the help of T cells. And so we are also interested what then happens to the individual cell, whether it clonally expands, whether it acquires uh, somatic mutations and diversifies the antibody uh, genes, and then which cells uh, get selected uh, over time during the response and become. Uh, memory cells or so resting cells that are available in the future when uh, the same pathogen is seen and can then immediately differentiate into antibody secreting cells or uh, the cells that directly become antibody secreting cells in the primary response and make antibodies that are then actually the effector molecules of humoral immune responses and, and protect the host from, from the infection. So we look at this at the population level, at the cell, uh, at the cell level, 
and also at the molecular level uh, in collaboration with structural biologists that uh, define exactly how antibodies bind to their specific targets. And this whole information we integrate uh, into the design of, of vaccines and try to manipulate the response so that we optimize uh, the quality of the antibodies that come out. And I briefly touch upon this because that's all preclinical so far and uh, hopefully in the future we'll go uh, clinical with these approaches. So the way we look at uh, visa responses is uh, based on a, a platform that Christian Bus in my lab developed many years back, which uh, is based on, on cells or, that we obtain from blood or from tissue. Uh, and that we isolate using single cell um, flow cytometric cell sorting. And we use the index um, cell sorting option, which allows us to sort different populations into, uh, into the same plate. Each well, of course, uh, gets one cell, uh, but because the software memorizes the phenotype of the cell, we can exactly say which cell went into which uh, well. We then amplify the antibody genes, the paired heavy and light chain genes by RT-PCR in these plates using a liquid handling platform. So we usually process many plates uh, in parallel. Uh, and each of the primers that we have in the, it's a nested PCR and the secondary PCR uses primers that have barcodes uh, and that uh, the primers are tagged according to columns or rows. And so the combination of these um, barcodes in the primer uh, as I mentioned comes from many plates usually uh, thousands of cells that we sort and analyze uh, and then this information goes into a database uh, we have an automated analysis pipeline to get all the gene information out uh, and then based on uh, this analysis, we identify cells uh, for which we would like to understand uh, the function of the antibody in terms of its binding specificity to the target. Um, and so we clone these genes into expression vectors and make recombinant monoclonal antibodies uh, for each one of the cells. And then can, of, uh, of course, determine binding of these antibodies in vitro or measure their affinity uh, using SPR, for example, surface plasma resonance. Uh, and we can also transfer these antibodies into mice, for example, and uh, see whether they protect from, from an infection. And so this was, uh, we developed this platform long before and there was 10x uh, or any commercial platform. And the, the beauty of this system is why we are still using it is because we have directly the gene amplicon available for cloning and don't need to synthesize the genes. And so it's, it's way cheaper uh, than 10x uh, and gene synthesis to obtain monoclonal antibodies. So in the end, what we can integrate is, of course, the cell phenotype data with the gene information of the antibodies, which uh, of course, as you know, serve as sort of natural barcodes. When we track cells over time, they acquire mutations and we can track the clonal evolution of the response at this level. So many years back, we, uh, when I was still at the Max Planck for infection biology, we became interested in, uh, in infections and specifically in infections with the human malaria parasite Plasmodium falciparum. This is a, a unicellular organism with a very complex genome with over 5,300 genes. Um, and it infects uh, humans when it's transmitted by the bite of an infected uh, Anopheles mosquito. So the mosquito injects these uh, so-called sporozoids. This is the stage of the parasite uh, here shown. Looks like this, this banana almost, uh, into the human skin during a blood meal. And usually it's estimated that 10 to maximum 100 parasites are injected at a given time. And from the skin, the parasite then moves to uh, uh, into the bloodstream and from there into the liver where it infects uh, hepatocytes for its further development. So in these hepatocytes, uh, it stays about a week and then comes out as uh, blood stage parasites that look completely different uh, and they are roundish and they infect red blood cells and don't so uh, change their shape and their gene expression profiles and their behavior uh, and infect red blood cells and multiply in red blood cells uh, 
and then burst from these red, red blood cells uh, when they matured and then infect new red blood cells. And so this is the cycle that uh, actually causes disease symptoms, whereas this part of the infection is completely asymptomatic. So you wouldn't know that you actually have the parasite in, in your liver. And the time it takes the parasite to move from the skin to the liver is, is within minutes or hours. So this is super fast. Uh, whereas this takes long time. And of course, here you can have billions of parasites in your blood and it's very difficult to clear the infection. Whereas here, the number of parasites is low. And so this is a, a stage of the parasite where antibodies can actually prevent the infection of liver cells. And that's why we got interested in, in this problem. And so ultimately, uh, sexual parasite stages develop. And when a mosquito takes a blood meal, takes up the sexual stages, then uh, fertilization can happen in the mosquito midgut. Uh, and so then this cycle can be closed. Uh, so it's, a, it's actually a preventable disease. There are drugs and uh, some of you may have traveled to Africa and uh, have taken medicine before, drugs to prevent the infection. It doesn't actually prevent the infection. It, it targets the blood stage parasites and kills them here. And because this part is asymptomatic, uh, you just don't feel that you have been uh, infected. So uh, of course, for many people, this, these drugs are not really available and, and that's still a problem. And we were specifically interested in the antibody response against the vaccine uh, target antigen that is known for a long time, which is this circumsporozoid protein that densely coats the surface of the parasite here shown in red. Uh, and it has about a million copies of this protein cover the surface. So it's, it's very uh, readily available to antibodies, to binding. And this protein is essential for the development of the parasite in the mosquito, but also in, in the mammalian host. Uh, so in humans, but also for um, other plasmodium parasites in, in mice, for example. The um, parasite, uh, sorry, the protein is, is uh, very special in, in a way that it has three domains, uh, an N-terminus, which is most likely already cleaved in the mosquito. That's still a bit unclear, but uh, there's very uh, low immune responses in, in humans, for example, against this part. Uh, and then it has a C-terminus that anchors the protein to the surface of the parasite through a GPI anchor. And very characteristic is this uh, central repeat domain, which is something that is completely unstructured. It's, it's a wobbly uh, protein uh, domain that is composed of, of repeating uh, units of always four amino acids. So each of these little boxes here represents one of these four amino acid motifs. Uh, and you see the blue ones are the so-called NAMP motifs and they are repeating. And then there are some variants of this form that are color coded here. So here actually you see, this is the NAMP repeats in this central uh, repeat domain. They are 100% conserved across all parasites uh, that have ever been looked at, and that's uh, hundreds. So all parasites uh, have it, uh, which is ideal because uh, it, it's assumed that uh, the parasite can't escape from antibodies by changing these uh, motifs. Um, and the antibodies uh, against these uh, repeats have been known for a long time, uh, initially shown in mouse models uh, and later with human monoclonals. Uh, that they can protect from uh, the infection if, if these antibodies are transferred in, in an animal and the animal is infected, uh, it, won't, it won't get um, parasites in the blood later on. So this is an ideal vaccine target, this unstructured domain. Uh, and then there's the structured C-terminus here, which is uh, containing all the T-cell epitopes. So we know we need uh, to have T cell help to get good B cell responses. And so uh, based on this knowledge, uh, people have designed in the 80s already a vaccine candidate that is actually now uh, recommended for use in highly endemic areas uh, in children that contains a number of these repeating NAMP motifs plus the complete C terminus to provide the B cell epitopes and, and the T cell epitopes. The problem with this uh, vaccine, RTSS, uh, is, is the vaccine, uh, the, the immunogenic C, um, CSP part, and ASO1 is the adjuvant. Uh, 
is that it's uh, limited in, in efficacy, less than 50% in, in these children, and protection is also uh, very short-lived, and you need actually three or four vaccinations to get to some degree of protection. So there is uh, hopefully room to improve this vaccine, and this is something we were uh, trying to understand. Can we make better antibodies and better responses uh, uh, through vaccination? And so the way we address this uh, question initially is first to understand how does the human immune system respond to this protein? Uh, and we initially tried actually to look at African donors that are naturally exposed uh, to these infections, but we, we couldn't find these cells that bound this uh, protein because the immune system is uh, only seeing 10 to 100 parasites when uh, the parasite is injected that have the CSP protein. And there are a million of blood stages, uh, blood stage parasites. So the response against this, this CSP is very weak in natural conditions. And to overcome this, we uh, collaborated with uh, uh, Benjamin Mordmüller and Peter Kremsner at the uh, uh, University of Tübingen, who are running um, whole parasite-based uh, immunization trials, so vaccine trials, where people are exposed or injected with uh, high numbers of the parasites under drug coverage. So as I mentioned, this uh, prevents the disease. And so what happens is that these people get IV injections of 50,000 sp uh, sporozoids uh, three times, four weeks apart, uh, and then mount a response against these parasites. And we could get blood samples always a week after each of these immunizations that I refer to as uh, one, two, three throughout the talk. And so from these um, blood samples, uh, we try to understand whether there is an induction of a B cell memory response uh, using fluorescently labeled protein. We determined the frequency of CSP reactive memory cells in these samples. And as you can see, uh, non-immunized had uh, this background here, but with the immunizations, the frequency of these cells increased suggesting that there was really a good uh, immune response induced by this uh, vaccination regimen. We then uh, made monoclonals from uh, many, many, a couple of hundred of these um, single cells here from, from the different donors uh, and tested the binding of these antibodies to these repeating NAMP motifs because these should be the protective antibodies. And so when we group these antibodies uh, based on the time point when we isolated the cells that made these antibodies, you can see that after one immunization, uh, most of the antibodies are poor binders, but then with repeated exposures, uh, the quality of the antibodies and the binding strength increased. And uh, as we hoped, uh, this also uh, went together with the more potent inhibition of the parasite in an in vitro assay that reads out uh, cell traversal through liver cells in the presence of the antibodies. So when uh, antibodies is present in the culture, the parasite doesn't really manage to go through these liver cells. And so this is uh, inhibition of parasites uh, is, is plotted here. So we thought, of course, the quality of the antibodies in increased over time, suggesting that actually uh, affinity maturation had worked very efficiently. Uh, and we assumed that this uh, increase in quality was linked to uh, the acquisition of somatic mutations during the response. Uh, so once I would get activated, it divides, it mutates. And so the, out, uh, the antibodies from the later cells would, would be stronger binders than the ones uh, that went into the response. To address this question, what uh, Raja Gopal Murugan, who, uh, former PhD and then postdoc in the lab, who now has his own group in, in Leiden uh, tested is that he identified cells that were clonally related and shared somatic mutations uh, and then measured their affinity by SVR to these repeating motifs. Uh, and you can see here each box here is uh, indicating a cluster of these related cells. Uh, that have the same precursor. And then you see that the antibodies that we made from these cells, they differed in their mutation load. So here is a very uh, low number of mutations, and here is a higher number of mutations. But when we look at the affinity, or Gupa looked at the affinity, that was very similar. No matter how many mutations the antibodies have acquired 
And this is also seen here, something that starts with lower affinity, mutates a lot the cell, uh, but none of these uh, descending cells and then makes a better antibody. Uh, and only very rare cases uh, shown with the blue arrows, you see that some antibodies uh, improved affinity, showed improved affinity. So that was surprising uh, because as I showed you, the response over time improved so much. So how could it uh, improve so much if the affinity maturation and selection of antibody variants did not really uh, improve the quality of the antibodies strongly? To address that, what Gopal did is he just plotted the number of mutations versus the binding strength of the antibody here measured just by ELISA, very simple. Uh, and separated again the antibodies that were cloned from early B cells or uh, B cells isolated after two immunizations or three immunizations. And what he observed is that initially, actually, uh, most of the cells that bound CSP, and this is how we uh, isolated them from the blood samples, already carried a lot of mutations here, or they carried few, but then they were not very good binders. So this suggested that actually the, uh, the responses started not only by naive cells, but also by pre-existing memory cells that probably showed some cross-reactivity with uh, some other antigen, or were just more readily activated uh, by this uh, parasite exposure. But with time, uh, what you see here is that more naive cells got recruited into the response that were actually already good binders to start with. So these antibodies had, were unmutated, but they bound uh, the parasite protein very well already. Uh, and you see that this, this is even higher after three immunizations. So a lot of these uh, potent precursors are recruited into the response. And then you see that they are mutating here, um, but they start out already with good binding uh, properties. We were interested, of course, in understanding what are these cells that are so potent binders. Um, and we looked at their gene usage um, and we observed, and this uh, work done also then by Katharina Imkeller from Ms. Gimdendela, that many of these cells shared very similar gene uh, usage. Uh, here, this uh, IGHV3-33 paired uh, most often with the Ig kappa v one 5 and so antibodies with these combinations were strongly enriched in this group here. Uh, and the structural analysis performed by our collaborator, Jean-Philippe Julien at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, uh, then showed that this 3-33 uh, gene uh, has a characteristic tryptophan at the, this position 52 in the CDR2 region of the heavy chain uh, that holds the, the antigen, the NAMP repeat here in this position very nicely. And so this explained the selection of this specific uh, gene that comes actually from a much larger family with very similar genes, but they do not express this tryptophan 52 here in this position and instead have serine or threamine. And, and that doesn't allow binding as we, we showed in one of these publications. So this explained the strong enrichment of these potent precursors in the response over time and also explained how the response could mature over time just through the recruitment of these cells uh, compared to the mutation. This uh, gene segment here or this combination was also very much enriched in, in the potent parasite inhibitors uh, and that again was expected because they bind to these NAMP repeats uh, very strongly. As I mentioned, uh, there was also, we also observed signs of mutations in these antibodies that were already good to start with, good binders to start with. And so we looked at the somatic mutation patterns of these antibodies. And uh, this is just an alignment of 63 of these antibodies from uh, four out of eight individuals that we looked at that uh, have this gene combination here, and also characteristic short kappa CDR3 region, which was also associated with good paras uh, parasite protein binding. And so you see there were uh, mutations that were selected at uh, these positions that are highlighted here. And we assumed, of course, that selection uh, is um, selecting for higher antibody affinity. And so Katarina um, removed these mutations from the antibodies individually or in combination. 
And what she saw is that when the antibodies did not have these uh, selected mutation series that expressed the germline uh, configuration, uh, then they were really showing lower affinity to these NAMP motifs. Uh, and this was true for this uh, position 31 and 50. But it was not true for the mutations that were selected here in CDR2 and this H56 and not in uh, Kappa CDR3 at this position 93. So that was uh, very puzzling and we had no clue how to explain this. And again, uh, work with our um, structural biology partners at SIGKIDS uh, and Steve Scully, uh, a postdoc in, in Jean-Philippe Gillian's uh, lab, obtained a crystal structure of um, actually two fab fragments bound to one um, molecule that contains five of these NAMP uh, repeating motifs. And so this is shown here in the center. Uh, this kind of yellow structure here is the NAMP antigen. And here you see a one fab and another fab binding to these opposite sides of these uh, repeating motifs. And so it's too small to show it here, but um, in the structure, you can clearly see that these uh, two amino acids here at position 31 and 50 in the heavy chain directly mediate contacts with the antigen, with the NAMP motifs. Whereas the other two, this uh, position 56 and kappa 93 uh, mutations, mediate contacts between these two antibodies. Uh, they don't have direct contacts to the antigen. Instead, they mediate what we call homotypic interactions between two of these uh, fabs here. So this indirectly actually improved the affinity of the antibody or avidity of the antibody, we should maybe say, uh, to the NAP uh, antigen because when uh, these mutations were reverted uh, to germline, uh, you see there was a loss in, in, in binding strength here. Uh, and this was even more pronounced when we artificially introduced uh, tyrosine mutations into, the, into these antibodies that prevent these homotypic interactions from happening. So this uh, effect is only observed, of course, with uh, uh, an antigen, so an NAMP uh, antigen that is long enough to accommodate two antibodies because it has five repeating units. This effect is not seen when you just have three repeating units because it doesn't allow binding of a second antibody here from the top or the bottom, depending on how you look. So it, it's an indirect uh, way of um, increasing affinity to antigens, we believe, that have repeating motifs. And uh, this was not the only antibody where we observed this. We had other antibodies that used different gene combinations that also showed it. And uh, this uh, was also observed, these homotypics, in a, in a separate study uh, looking at CSP antibodies from Ian Wilson's lab. Um, uh, yeah, that also identified these homotypic interactions. So we think this is something definitely that is uh, observed now many times for CSP antibodies. Uh, and we believe it's probably not just specific for CSP antibodies, but others as well. So the question is, how, how, is the, how are these antibodies then selected that carry these mutations? Um, we try to understand whether uh, these homotypic antibody-antibody interactions improve uh, the inhibition of the parasite. But we could not observe this uh, in vitro or in vivo when we passively transferred the antibodies in a mouse model and tried to infect these mice. There was no difference whether the antibodies carried these uh, sterical hindrance mutations that prevent these interactions from happening or were just the, the original antibody. So Katarina, um, Proposed that maybe the difference comes when we uh, bring these antibodies back into the context of a cell and make them as a B cell receptor, uh, express them on the surface, where they can engage into these interactions. And we thought that then maybe the antigen binding induces stronger signaling and cross-linking of the B cell receptors uh, when this additional interaction can happen compared to the mutant. And this is actually shown here. So the wild type antibody induces strong. Uh, BCR signaling is read out as calcium flux, whereas the one that has the sterical hindrance and also the others uh, that I'm not showing here uh, showed much delayed uh, and, and weaker responses, and this can be quantified. 
And so when we look at um, and then the frequency of these cells that have these homotypic interactions in our whole population of B cells that uh, make these kind of antibodies with these gene combinations, we see that there's really an enrichment in the CSP binding antibodies compared to the rest of the repertoire, and especially among the expanded cells. So we think this stronger B cell activation signal allows the cells also to proliferate more and have a selective advantage in, in the B cell response to uh, this parasite or the immunization. So the question, uh, another question came up and that is that we defined these NMP motifs and the field, not just us, but other groups as well as the target of protective antibodies. But as I mentioned before, and as you see here, it's not only NAMP motifs, there are very similar motifs that are structurally very similar uh, that are located here in what we call the N-terminal junction. Uh, there is a single NPDP motif and some NVDP motifs here. And there's also a very similar NANA motif in the C-terminus. And the, the question we had and uh, that was proposed is that antibodies that target the junction may be more potent than antibodies that uh, target the repeat and maybe only because the junction sticks out more from the parasite surface. So because that was uh, hypothesized based on maybe a handful of antibodies that other group uh, from Bob Cedar's lab looked at, and also Antonio Lanzarecca's lab, uh, we decided to test our collection of antibodies for cross-reactivity to these uh, epitopes. And so this is something you see here. Um, we could identify different uh, binding profiles for our CSP reactive antibodies. Some were very specific for these uh, repeating NAMP motifs that you can see here, uh, but many were actually cross-reacting with either also the NVDP or even NPDP or even all of these motifs as shown here. So the majority of antibodies were actually not specific for, for NAMP motifs. Instead, the majority could bind to any of these epitopes. And strikingly, we did not observe antibodies that only bound to these junctional uh, variant motifs. So the question is, uh, then how can an antibody bind to these uh, quite dissimilar motifs where we always think of antibodies as something super specific uh, and so we looked at one antibody specifically that showed a uh, very good affinity to all the different peptides in these regions that we looked at. Uh, and they are listed here. And so uh, when we looked at co-crystal structures of this antibody with different peptides that cover these uh, different uh, repeating motifs, uh, we observed that they would always bind the peptide in the same conformation as you see here. And always in the core position of the paratope, you would find, uh, or most preferably, an NAMP motif. So based on this uh, information, we could identify this core epitope of binding uh, motif for this antibody. And we observed it also for other antibodies. So it seems that the antibodies prefer NAMP in the center of the binding uh, pocket and then can accommodate the other variant motifs more on the outside. The question then was, how does an antibody become a cross uh, binder? So cross reactive to these other epitopes. Uh, and this is uh, assessed here. So we just plot the binding affinity of these antibodies uh, that are either NAMP specific or the ones that are cross reactive to the junctional epitopes. And what you see here is that the ones that are Cross binders always have a higher affinity, not just to the NAMP motifs, but also to these variant motifs. So cross reactivity is associated with higher affinity. And uh, the question then was, how is that linked to better protection? And so we assessed a couple of antibodies in a, a passive transfer model. This is work uh, performed at the Max Planck in Berlin. Our collaborators, uh, Julia Costa and Elena Levashina. And you see that actually uh, 317, for example, is an antibody that has a very strong preference for just the NAMP and is very high affinity. Uh, whereas this 4.93 antibody is the one that's very cross-reactive uh, and has also high affinity and we do not see a difference. So really there was no difference whether in, in potency of the antibodies, whether it 
prefer to bind to just NAMPs or whether it was cross-reactive. Uh, and the only difference we saw with this antibody is that affinity overall made a difference. So this antibody was weaker affinity, lower affinity, and therefore it wasn't as potent. So it seems that it's not relevant where the antibodies bind in the repeating uh, domain of the CSP as long as they bind with high affinity. So that would uh, still suggest that um, we would like to include this part of the um, of the protein here in vaccine design. And so that leaves us uh, with a question, what about the C-terminus? The vaccine that I mentioned contains the C-terminus because of the T-cell epitopes, but do, does that any good for the antibody response? And so we had previously shown that uh, one antibody against the C-terminus actually shows no parasite inhibitory activity whatsoever here in this mouse transfer model compared to the antibodies against the repeat. And this was recently confirmed in an independent study that antibodies against the C-terminus cannot, uh, cannot inhibit the parasite at all. So they are lost from the response uh, and show no activity. Uh, and so that's a problem because actually when we immunize with the protein, the strongest response, uh, antibody response isn't used against the C-terminus and not against the repeat that makes the protective uh, B cell, uh, contains the protective B cell epitopes. So how can we get around this uh, for vaccine des design? Because we want T cell help and T cell help is encoded in the C terminus. Uh, we reasoned that the T, T cells recognize peptides, not uh, conformational epitopes. And so maybe we just need to identify short peptides in the C terminus that are a good activators of T cell help and would not induce antibody responses. And that's work by Ilka Wahl in the lab. Uh, she worked on this for quite some time. Uh, again, went into human samples from individuals that were immunized with the parasite, isolated T follicular helper cells from the samples that showed an activated phenotype based on PD-1 and ICOS expression. You see this uh, is a clear response here after the immunization. Uh, looked at the clonal diversity of these cells and then selected uh, T cell receptors for expression uh, in jerked cells, cell lines that don't have their own TCR. And then she made these cell lines and uh, stimulated them with B cells from the same individuals that she pulsed with uh, peptides from CSP, from the protein. And then she measured activation of the T cells in an ELISA that reads out IL-2 secretion. And so what Ilka um, could show is that actually the vast, vast majority of all T cell receptors that she isolated from different individuals recognized a very small peptide uh, comprising only 22 amino acids in the C terminus. And so this seemed to be an optimal target. Uh, and we know that this short peptide cannot induce antibody responses. Uh, so unfortunately, this um, peptide is quite polymorphic in the parasite, so it's not an ideal uh, it, for a vaccine because it will never boost the response uh, after a natural infection, uh, but it's a very potent activator of T cells. And so when we bring all of this information together, what uh, we showed is that, first of all, in the naive B cell repertoire, human have already very good uh, CSP binders cells that are encoded by these genes are very uh, strong CSP, show strong CSP, CSP reactivity. They can get very good T cell help uh, from T cells that just recognize a very small peptide in the C terminus. We show that, that then these cells get activated, they expand and they mutate. Uh, and that in this mutation process, they, the mutations are not only selected based on higher affinity to the antigen directly, but also uh, through this homotypic affinity maturation um, selection process. And uh, I haven't told you, but uh, we see that, uh, no, sorry, this I showed you, <laughs> um, that actually in the N-terminal junction of CSP, there are also uh, good antibodies, uh, whereas the non-protective epitopes uh, for antibodies are in the C-terminus. So this information we use to design a vaccine and uh, this is based on a nanoparticle structure that, again, our collaborator designed uh, 
where we can really hide. Sorry to interrupt, but we only have a couple of minutes less left in a meeting. This, so. this is my last slide. OK, so, great. So yeah. Um, so this is the particle, and you see that we induce very strong responses against the repeat and the junction, and these are also durable. So this uh, induces also protection in mice. When we challenge these mice, they are protected fully at the you know day 51, and also even later, they are quite protected. So this will hopefully move forward into the clinics at some point. And this is just to acknowledge the people, everyone who worked on this is highlighted here in black, the collaborators I mentioned former lab members and uh, and funding by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And sorry for being late. I see that. Uh, yes, sorry. No worries. It was a fascinating talk. So thank you so much. Um, are there any questions from the audience? So as a reminder, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you or you can type your question in the chat. Um, so while we wait, uh, why don't I ask the first question? So. Um, you uh, mentioned that the mutations arise in, uh, and improve the um, the affinity of, of the binding affinity essentially. So, what was the variability um, in the cohort that you had among the individuals of the mutations that that you that you found, and uh, also did the mutations occur that really conveyed the um, the higher affinity levels occur at similar time points? So as I showed, in, initially the response is driven by cells that carry already a very high number of mutations, like 20 or 30 that came from previous infections. And then you can see that over the three immunizations, the newly recruited cells can accumulate at maximum, I would say, 10 mutations mm -hmm. in the two months time frame, right, with three immunizations. So that's usually what you see. And then it depends where this, the antibody mutates how high it can go in the affinity. It's mostly driven by the original affinity. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the audience? I don't see any. Uh, since we are already at the time point, um, I would say we close it. And uh, thanks again for this fascinating talk. And um, we see each other again uh, on March 1st for the next um, iteration of this lecture. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.